Megan, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Am I speaking with Megan or a slightly fictionalized version? <laughs> For today, I'm doing pure Megan, but maybe halfway through the interview, I'll do uh, fictionalized and I'll let you know. <laughs> okay. I want to make sure that I get this right. This is your first show that you've run, your yes. first time showrunner. And yes. I'd, re I'd read about how you want to uh, honor the franchise, but bring your own sensibility to it. And I got a chance to watch it last night. I watched all of the episodes and really enjoyed it. Oh, so fun. what elements are, um, what, what's your consideration to what you're bringing in versus honoring the franchise? Yeah. Um, well, you know, on the franchise end, there was this uh, great starting point, which is that Bumper and Peter, played by Flula Borg, both appeared in the movies, and they were very funny. They're antagonists in the movies. You don't really know that much about either of them. So I thought that was actually a really great way into a show because you're not so beholden to a backstory that you can't invent new details, but you already know what their comedic styles are. Um, and then we, of course, brought the music over from Pitch Perfect. We have a ton of acapella. We also have a ton of original music. Ryan Tedder, a very famous songwriter, wrote a song for us. But in terms of what I, you know, was excited to bring from my own background and perspective, I have written for a lot of shows that have an absurdity to them, but mm -hmm. a sweetness and that friendship is a big part of it. Um, the Good Place and Parks and Rec, which were created by Mike Schur, both are shows that I feel like I cut my teeth on and really learned a lot from. So I tried to bring some of that weirdness and world building, um, but friendship to this world that uh, could have been populated by two antagonists. But there's like a sweetness and a weirdness to it. Okay, I have to ask you because you talked about your comedy background rather than the music. What would be your go-to karaoke song? That is a great question. And I actually have like a very strong, not strong, you can decide if it's strong, but like passionate answer to it. I am obsessed with karaoke. In in better times, I did karaoke like once a week in Los Angeles. I always sing Mambo Italiano by Rosemary Clooney. If you know that song, like the back of your hand, no one's expecting it. And it's a real performance piece. I also really like Stand By Your Man by Tammy Wynette. Mm. So different options. Okay, you've given me permission because you said better times. Always so curious about this because, you know, writing for The Good Place, I feel like you were maybe a tad too early that... You know, you predicted it. We're we're kind of we're kind of in in many ways we're in the we're in the bad place now. But still, oh, yeah. <laughs> watching a show like this, which is really funny, comedic, how much do you consider sort of bringing in real world elements or you know the tragedy of right now into comedy? No, that's a really good question. I also think like not to make comedy writers seem too self serious, but I do think we take that responsibility at least in my room seriously of like you do have a responsibility when making a tv show to talk about real issues i think the way that that came out in this pitch perfect show was that there are a lot of jokes in the show that are at the expense of americans and they're pretty you know loving and self-deprecating especially when bumper is sort of being silly about his own ignorance. But there also were issues that in going to a place like Berlin, which is incredibly progressive and uh, climate active and active in a lot of other ways, different types of healthcare than America, there are jokes in our show that are truly based from like my experience of seeing how different countries can tackle their problems. Um, but yes, I agree. We may be in the bad place, but I also hope people watching the shows I've worked on will at least feel a little better about it. Do you say that you're Emmy nominated now? I would actually say that before any other descriptor of myself. Mm -hmm. What was it like to do a um, a series in which you're kind of riffing on the Emmys and then you are 
nominated for the Emmy. I wanted to see you win it, by the way. I thank I you so much. So I also funny. did. No, I, you know, I, if anything, am just a loving rascal. And that web series, an Emmy for Megan, truly came out of me hearing that there was a new category that year, which was 2018 for best web series or short form content. And I just thought, what's the worst that happens? I make a web series. I wanted to act and direct more. Uh, if I don't get nominated, like who really cares? But then I did get uh, three Emmy nominations for the two years that I did the show. And it felt like a really fun joke that we were all in on together. I did not win though. <laughs> no. On that note, how does it feel in a show like this, I've noticed and talked to sort of maybe some of your former colleagues about it, to have a show on Peacock, it does feel a bit kind of like the Wild West in that, you know, you can play around with the form a little bit. You have episodes of different lengths and, you know, it, it feels cinematic. It is in a different location. You know, how much do you feel like you're sort of forging a path with a show? Yeah, no, it, I thought it was like such an exciting opportunity. I've worked for you know, network for NBC for a long time. And in some ways, I think that makes you a better writer because it makes you really have to be lean with your writing because the episodes are shorter. Um, you can't, you know, swear there's different sorts of uh, sensor issues you're dealing with. So I did try to bring that sense of restraint to a streaming episode, but it was so nice to not have to worry about the letter of the law when it comes to length. And I'm glad you brought up what the show looks like because that was really important to me and our three directors did an incredible job. I wanted this to look and feel like a movie and Peacock and Universal who made the show were really supportive of that. And it's a beautiful high production value show in a city that I think has a really unique beauty to it. So as like a film nerd, I was really excited to get to make a show that looked like that. Right. I'm about to talk with some of your actors from the show that seem to bring in sort of different approaches to comedy. Um, and I'm curious because yourself, you know, you have very famous for your Twitter feed. You you, you tend to be a, a, a good sharer, maybe an overshare, but, you know, there's an element of sort of self-reflectiveness. What are, what are they what are they like in terms of their approaches? Did you find some that had similar approaches to you or maybe different approaches to comedy? You know, I it was very important to me on my first show that I was running that the set felt incredibly safe and respectful and obviously literally I mean that but also in terms of comedy. I was like I want us to genuinely be friends and that if you maybe aren't as used to improvising, I want you to feel safe that no one is going to make fun of you or that you can get off topic and that's okay. Like there was a current of fun that underlied everything, I think. Um, so you have people like Adam is the most consummate professional person. Like he is so incredibly hardworking. He is in like every scene of this show, but he also is really comfortable improvising. He's really collaborative. He would let me know if he didn't like a joke or didn't like something. And I really appreciated that. So I think just a ton of open communication, which is I think the key to like most things. I should hope so, yeah. Um, <laughs> on, on that note, I wanted to say, uh, I've appreciated communicating with you. This has been really wonderful to get a chance to hear from you. Uh, perfect segue. Thank you so much. This was really fun. 